Hi, I'm David Griffith, editor of Police Magazine. We're here at uh, Police Week uh, 2011 with uh, Trooper Kevin Caldwell of the Michigan State Police. Uh, Trooper Caldwell is the uh, June 2010 Officer of the Month from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. And tell us about the 2009 off-duty incident that led to your being named June 2010 Officer of the Month. Well, what happened was is I was leaving uh, school. I was in the seminary and I was uh, leaving from Detroit Theological Seminary. And I pulled out and just happened to pull out behind a police car just traveling down the road and was just following behind him. And we got a couple blocks and started hearing repetitive gun gunfire, specifically a shotgun. And the officer had uh, slammed on his brakes and subsequently I slammed on my brakes. Uh, he turned around and uh, I did as well. And uh, we pulled into a, a subdivision street we had just passed. Uh, we had heard this repetitive gunfire. Uh, when he pulled out, he pulled out, uh, parked his car in the middle of the street, and I was uh, very close behind him. The officer got out and started walking towards a house, and, and he was uh, shot uh, several times at that point. Uh, come to find out, he was hit with uh, a shotgun uh, in the chest. He had uh, rounds lodged in his nose all the way down to his shin, and he was hit 30 times. Uh, from there, uh, we backed up. Uh, the officer backed up to his uh, patrol vehicle. What ensued was a gunfight. Uh, eventually, the uh, suspect who was firing from his residence from an elevated position uh, barricaded. He shot the uh, glass next to the patrol officer's uh, face and uh, kind of exploded. The officer was bleeding heavily. Uh, the officer came off the car. I left from my position behind my uh, personal vehicle. Uh, I was armed with my 40 caliber handgun. I was wearing church clothes. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't wearing anything other than that. And uh, the officer moved to the uh, moved him to a cement wall, which was basically just adjacent to the house where the gunfire was erupting from. And I assessed the officer's wounds. There was severe bleeding on his chest through his uniform, uh, pulled on his chest. And, um, you know, as officers, we, we typically, a lot of us always think about, all right, what if we got shot and we had that blood on our uniform? But what a relief when uh, we ripped open, I ripped open his shirt and the pooling of blood had been from his face that had pulled up in the co top collar of his vest. And uh, all the rounds on his chest had been stopped by his vest. And uh, he had some real good shots to his arm. Well, I did first aid on him there. And uh, at that point, another local officer arrived. And we uh, advised the officer to take him to the hospital immediately. Uh, but before he did, I commandeered his AR-15 rifle from him. This rifle, I specifically remember, was covered in blood. And uh, I slung it on and holstered my uh, pistol. After the officer had left the scene, I left uh, from that wall. And for all intents and purposes at that point, it was just myself and the suspect there. And no other police officers were there. I moved back out. Uh, I had the thought that the suspect was going to exit his, the house and just start shooting people. So I left and get, took cover behind my engine block and my personal vehicle. Uh, he started firing again. Uh, from there, then a, additional officers. This is a urban area of Allen Park. There were several officers there within uh, a, a very short time. Uh, I moved behind a cement wall that was real close to the residence, the same one where me and the officer were before he was transported. And for around the next two and a half to three hours, was a sustained gun battle, and uh, there were, uh, I specifically remember rounds hitting right next to me, hitting the wall right over my head, and uh, terminally, the subject was shot and killed and uh, deceased. Uh, shortly after that, uh, a LAV, a light armored vehicle, came by and uh, picked me up, and I returned back to the uh, 
command trailer and was debriefed and turned over the rifle to the, to the investigators. You're responding off duty, you're in your church clothes, you said that, and how do you identify yourself to the Allen Park officer to let him know, hey, I'm one of the good guys, don't shoot at me? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things they train us is being off duty. Well, it helped a little bit, I think, with the haircut that I have. Okay. But as he, we were exiting, I know the gunfire was immediate. And when he got there, he was walking out. But I, I we remember screaming at him, you know, state trooper, state trooper. You know, and I, I have a weapon out. And uh, I, I believe he heard me. But uh, that's, that's the means by which to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And you were left all alone trying to, I guess, contain this man who barricaded himself in this house. How long until backup actually arrived? Uh, it was there within probably five minutes, and there were several officers there, and additional SWAT teams came in, obviously, during those hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, the subject, this, this deceased, what he was doing is he had multiple weapons throughout different windows in his house. And what he would do, he would fire from around six inches behind the window, so you could only see the barrel flash. And he would fire, empty his weapon, reload, put his weapon back down, move to the next window, fire, reload, put the weapon. So he was constantly moving through his house. So those five minutes that you were out there alone behind the brick wall, were you under fire? Yes. Yeah. And um, what a sound. What a sound to hear other officers and sirens, you know. Uh, when it comes to Calvary, here they come. And, I can't uh, imagine. And, and that would... Uh, and people say, would you do it again in a heartbeat? Now, my wife would disagree with that. <laughs> but um, but to, have a, uh, to have another officer, I don't think there's any other police officer that would not have taken the same action. And, and, and that's it. And, and this incident really solidified. Uh, you know, I was in seminary. I've since become an Army chaplain. And uh, what, it's, what this incident has done is help me bridge the gap with other soldiers and other officers, even with our, uh, even in law enforcement, is because, you know, I've been there. I know what you're facing. I've been at that point of, of helplessness, you know, those feelings of, you know, why did this happen, you know? But, you know, I'm here. You know, I survived it, I wasn't shot. And I believe that's by God's grace. But responding off duty, that's probably one of the most dangerous things an officer can do. I, I would agree. There's. Uh, you know, there's no radio. Communications is a big problem. I, I can specifically remember as the officers were arriving screaming. I did not want to be shot by one of my own. And, and just being able to, you know, uh, do something like that, you know, without communication, yeah, it's very, very dangerous. But, you know, uh, to be there for another officer, for me, you know, that, that's what it's all about. It's just, it's a brotherhood. It doesn't matter the, the shape of your badge. It doesn't matter, matter the color of your uniform. You know, what matters is a band of brothers and sisters, you know, who stand up and stand on that line of chaos, you know, and say, you know what, we're in arms and we're gonna, we're gonna battle this, this thing together. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.